Right now at stake is the security of this country, and those borders have to have a wall, as he himself has said. If you have the objective of building a wall for border security to stop illegal immigration, you take what you can get when you can get it, and you keep asking for more, demanding more, or what have you. Do another shutdown and then right, make tracks right to that national emergency. Just play this out, keep it focused on immigration. As long as people are talking about immigration, you are winning, Mr. President. But whatever happens, just build the wall. I'm gonna be signing a national emergency. And it's been signed many times before. Look, I expect to be sued. I shouldn't be sued. Very rarely do you get sued when you do national emergency. The primary fight was on the wall. Everything else we have so much, as I said, I don't know what to do with it. We have so much money. But on the wall, they skimped. This is a tunnel. This is the second tunnel that recently that we have located. This is an area that we actually have wall. Bad day for democracy. I'm Barry Gordon. And I'm Andre Coleman. And this is News Wrap, live at 5. Well, I never thought I'd see this. I really, I really didn't. Uncharted and territory for you? Uncharted territory. Okay. You think? I think maybe a little homeschooling is in order here. Professor Gordon, can I do it? Class is in session. All right, Break I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you a little brief lesson on constitutional history. Okay. All right. Because what you guys are going to be hearing, you're going to be hearing a lot about the Constitution, and people are going to use catchphrases, and they're going to say power grab, and they're going to say separation of powers, and they're going to say all of these things. <laughs> it's going to mean of nothing. Right. It's going to mean nothing to you. So when I say that this is maybe the most important day in our democracy and the worst day in our democracy, let me explain what I mean by that, okay? Because we have a government that was set up like no other in 17... 17- 87. You're right? going all the way back, huh? All the way back. All right. Don't bring right? it forward one day at a time, though. I won't bring it forward right. one day at a time. So, it was created because the founding fathers had read a lot of stuff. They read books and they read all kinds of things about how to do it right, how to create a government that worked. And the first thing they decided was you don't give a lot of power to one person. Mm-hmm. Or one branch of government, because that's what King George III was all about, right? I'm sure you've seen Hamilton. Checks and balances. Or heard about Hamilton. That's what King George III is about. So, checks and balances. And the way you do that is you separate powers. So what are the powers? You create one body that makes the laws, that writes the laws. You create another body that enforces the laws, Mm -hmm. right? And you create a third body that judges the laws. Okay, that interprets. And later on, they, they took the power in a thing called Marbury versus Madison in a case where they said, we're going to decide what's constitutional and not constitutional, mm-hmm. and that power went to the Supreme Court. Really clean so far. Now, the one thing that they wanted to do was to make sure, because they understood that money is power, and as long as the president could raise money, spend money, however he or she wanted. It wasn't she in those days, but it can be now. As long as the president could do that, then you don't have a separation of power. Of course. He's running the whole show. Right. So they said no. They said there's only one of these three bodies that can do that, and that is the Congress. Okay. The Congress of the United States. So they gave the Congress what they call the power of the purse. And what that means, very simply, is that only Congress can raise money, decide how much money to raise, and decide how much money to spend Okay. on their priorities. And by doing that, Congress set priorities for the country. That was the point. And all the power the president had 
was to then enforce the laws that Congress passed. All right. Today, you saw a president who basically said, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care what Madison said. I don't care what Hamilton said. I don't care. This is important to me. I'm going to take money that was supposed to be used for other reasons. Which Congress approved for other reasons. Which Congress approved for other reasons. I'm just going to use it. Just going to use it. Now, the reason I think this is so horrible is that there was another change that has happened over time, which is that the Constitution gives Congress another power, the power to declare war. And over time, that's been eroded. And there have been excuses for that. By not declaring war, by going and having skirmishes. Skirmishes, police actions, as it was called in Korea. Conflicts. Or a bombing. Exactly. So that power already disappeared, but we said, well, that's foreign policy, and in today's age, you have to act quickly, and you have to be able to respond to threats, right? So maybe we'll give the president more power. And this is not that situation. As a matter of fact, it's not that situation because the president himself said it wasn't that situation because he said, I don't have to do this. That's what he said today. He said, there's a national emergency, and then in the next breath he said, I don't have to do this, but I want to do it faster. And that's the key. He declared a national emergency so that he can use money that Congress has appropriated elsewhere. Right to build a wall, whatever he decides that is. That's right. And wherever he decides now that that will go, correct? Yes. Okay, so what would, do you know, and this I know this is coming out of the (laughs) book, so do you know what would constitute a national emergency? Of course, Uh, a natural disaster, a flood, an earthquake, a hurricane. Like we see in Puerto Rico. An actual invasion. We've had national emergencies. 9-11 was, was a national emergency. Swine flu was a national emergency. Those are emergencies that pop up. They're unanticipated, right? Mm-hmm. But even that doesn't give you the power necessarily to move money around right. it, it, to do the things that you want to do. Right. And generally, when there's a national emergency... It is, the Congress is already in support of that. They want to do something about a hurricane. They want to do something about an earthquake. They want to do something about an invasion. Here, a clear message was sent to the president. We don't want your freaking wall. Congress acted. That's right. And he signed the bill. And we'll give you some money to repair. Build a fence. And to build some slats somewhere. But we're going to give, and he even said... He got a whole lot of other things. He got money for the ports of entry. He got a great border security package. He got the package he wanted. He just didn't get it for the wall. And he signed that bill, right? Right. So is the president of the United States now breaking the law, in your opinion? Oh, I, I think he's violating the Constitution, and I would call that breaking the law. He's breaking the federal structure of our country. I think that that's breaking the law. If George Washington or John Adams or Thomas Jefferson, I won't go through the whole list of presidents. Don't don't go through them all. I'll stop at the founding fathers. If any of them had done this, they would have been instantly impeached. Instantly. And instantly thrown out of office. I don't even want to go into what would happen in modern times. Because, you know... We have all of these Supreme Court justices. We have all of these conservative freedom caucus people, right? And the first thing they say is, we have to interpret the Constitution the way the founding fathers meant it to be interpreted. They're called originalists. Well, on this one, I'm an originalist. And what I'm saying is that it's crystal clear that the president should have no power to move money simply to support priorities that the Congress has not embraced. It is crystal clear. So why is he doing it 
And, and I'm playing the role of interviewer here today, okay, just so that we can get this information out to the people. Good. So why do you think he's doing it on this issue? Really? Yeah. Why do you think he's doing it on the wall? Why do you think he's breaking this law and he's turning to this power grab, like the words you use? Yeah. Why is he doing it on this issue? Didn't you see why in the cold open? Of course, but why this <laughs> issue? I know you I know, saw why in the cold open, right? Well, I know why they said. I'm asking for your opinion. Why do you? I'll think give you four numbers. Go ahead. Two zero, two zero. Exactly. That's it. See, here's the point. I'm gonna I'm toss an, an opinion in here. Go for it. This president. I'm done with my schooling. This president could not care less about building a wall. He needs a boogeyman. Right. And in order to have a boogeyman, he has turned to poor people of color mm -hmm. to scare his base and to say we have to stop those people. If he does not have a boogeyman and a deep swamp right. to drain, he goes into 2020 just with his failures. Right. He hasn't built a wall, and, and he's failed on this anyway because Mexico didn't pay for it. He hasn't built a wall. I, I won't even go into the other things that he hasn't done, but you know what they are. And that small base, which is not really expanding anyway, he begins to lose some of it. When Pelosi kicked his butt during the standoff, Coulter, Fox News, mm -hmm. the heavyweights in his base began to, to you know, you could see yeah. the cracks. You could see the cracks. You could. This is his way of trying to shore up the base. That's all this is. He needs the battle. And he's willing to tear up the Constitution for it. Yes. So what does that say? He's never given a damn about the Constitution of the country. So does that mean the Congress doesn't give a damn about it? Because if they support him, they don't give a damn about it. The full it Congress? Yeah. Or the Senate? Or the, or the Republicans in Congress? Uh, Mitch McConnell obviously doesn't give a damn because he's I'm going up and with the Republicans it. right now. Well, Mitch McConnell stood up and supported it. Uh, Lindsey Graham, every time he sees Trump, he puts on his lip gloss and makes a run and start at his behind puckered up. Come on, of course they don't care. Mm -hmm. All they care about is keeping power. I know. If they cared about the people, we wouldn't be in this situation. If they cared about the people, he wouldn't even still be the president. However, we do have a national emergency. Yeah, we do. You want to tell them about it? I will. So at least five people were killed today in a mass shooting in Illinois. That's right. And once again, we come back to gun violence. Mm -hmm. Now, what's this guy's name? It's right Gary there. Gary Martin. Gary Martin. Mm -hmm. Let's just take a guess about Mr. Martin. Do you think Mr. Martin came across the border and committed this horrible, heinous act? Highly doubtful. So the number of people killed by gun violence versus the number of people killed by people coming across the border. Right. Which do you think is more? Which do you think is less? Right. And of course, now this terrible precedent's been set because now a Democratic president, mm -hmm. we may like it, but I still think it's a terrible precedent. Of course because it is. a Democratic president can say, I'm declaring a national emergency. On climate we have, change. On, on climate change, gun on gun violence. Yep on whatever, yeah. right? And what will happen is that power will, just like, that, just like we're seeing now, it will erode more and more and more until national emergencies become things like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have an election in November because mm -hmm. I'm losing and the, and the country is separated and there's violence. Yeah. Or there could be violence, so I'm going to declare a national emergency and we're going to do this instead. This is what happens when powers erode. It's the worst case scenario, and but that's definitely people. the direction that we're moving in. Uh, looks Shall like we, we shift to local? Uh, let's do this comment first. Okay. Ha ha. Uh, Pelosi didn't kick Donald Trump's butt. Donald Trump put his own foot in his mouth. It was an easy win for Pelosi. Um, I would, I would uh, say both happened. I would too. <laughs> I would agree. I would, I would agree. go with both happened. Yeah, would, this, this right here, though has to play out, and that's right. where this gets scary, because right. if this goes to the Supreme Court, which I believe it will, then we got to start thinking about the justices and how they may go. Well, frankly, I mean, and, as I said, Gorsuch and, and Kavanaugh and Alito and all of those folks talk about the Constitution yeah. and the separation of powers all the time. Right. 
and they were taking on Obama, yes. you know, for executive action. And that wasn't even taking away money. Right. That just had to do right. with just how thing. he wanted to enforce right. cases, which right. he had the power to do. Right. So, I'll, so I'll, if that was questionable, how can this not be? Well, this is extremely, extremely inappropriate. And I'll, I'll exactly. say this, Emmanuel. Where she still has an opportunity, and I think this will happen, if she forces a vote on this, then the Republicans have to, because it won't pass the House. It'll go to the Senate then. Right. And then the Republicans will have to say, this is where I stand on this issue, which one month ago, all of them said they stood against. That's right. You have, you have to force them to take a side. Let's take a look at the news brief, and then we'll talk about some happier news for Pasadena. All right. But at least for some people. <laughs> <laughs> it's tax time and people across the nation are finding they aren't getting tax refunds like they used to. Some are actually owing money due to recent changes in the tax code. The IRS has responded to angry taxpayers saying that the smaller returns are likely due to the fact that not enough was being withheld from their paychecks and that instead of seeing their turn at the end of the year, many people have received a slight bump in their paychecks throughout 2018. Tax experts are suggesting that people learn from this year's filing and adjust their paycheck withholdings for 2019 to avoid similar issues when filing next year. There is a political drug war being waged in Pasadena. Golden State Collective Cannabis Dispensary operator Sean Zamite is spearheading a petition to recall Pasadena Council Member Victor Gordo. In an article published by Pasadena Now, Zamite says the recall is not related to his marijuana dispensary, but accuses Councilmember Gordo of being non-responsive to the needs of his constituents and instead putting personal and political interests ahead of those he represents. Golden State Collective was raided recently and four people, including Zamite, were due in court on the 13th to face several misdemeanor charges related to the operation of the cannabis dispensary in Pasadena. One of the defendants failed to appear. Arraignment was postponed until March 22nd. Pasadena City Council approved the accelerated timeline to a $15 minimum wage on Monday, February 11th. Monday's council meeting included presentations from the two researchers who analyzed the effects of the wage increases made since 2016. Their findings reported that the increases did not have an overtly negative impact on the local economy. The local restaurateurs also made their case for why the city should slow down the current timeline in favor of the state's schedule, stating that they will be the most hurt by this action after several years of increasing operational costs. And we don't want to join the ranks of the six independently owned restaurants that have gone out of business in the past two years. The meeting was filled to overflowing with over 50 people asking to speak during public comment. The majority spoke in favor of the current Pasadena timeline. What's the point in having a dream if you can't even have or achieve stability? The meeting concluded with a seven to one vote in favor of the accelerated timeline with Council Member Hampton as the lone dissenting vote. We're back. Now, there are several ways to watch us, by the way. You can catch past episodes on Pasadena Media's YouTube channel. You can keep up to date by liking our Facebook page. However you do it, join the conversation. It's not a conversation. It was just the two of us talking right. to each other. We, right. can, we can do that in a restaurant. Yep. So join the conversation. Like, share, subscribe, comment, because we really depend on that. So... We did a lot on this minimum wage. They uh, we did. We did two we did. good shows two on great that. Shows. And uh, it passed. It passed. A little seven to one vote. Yeah, I was, the vote was a little different than I expected. What did you think? I thought it was going to be six two. I thought Masuda was going to be uh, with Hampton. Really? Mm hmm. I thought it was going to be unanimous. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I think in the end, if you're an elected official, can you really tell people we're taking your raise away this year? I mean, I think that's really what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah. That's how people, no matter what you say about we're doing this for the business community or we have to do this for this, it comes down to people will hear you say, we're taking your raise away. Yeah. And I don't know what politician wants to say that. But I'm going to tell you something, man, about this one. I, I would have thought Masuda would have backed the, the restaurants. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can see that. And I, and I, like, I, I liked some of what McAustin said about the businesses with 25 or less, putting them on the state schedule, mm -hmm. giving them the break. But I'm going to tell you, like no other issue I've seen in a long time, this one has created divisions that are going to echo through this community for years to come. Because the restaurant owners are still upset. 
There is talk of uh, creating a, a restaurant association. Some rumors that they'll keep their money in their pockets yeah. and not support candidates. Um, who knows if they're going to find a candidate and push somebody forward in the next election. Yeah. So I, th I think you're going to see some further. I, I don't think you're going to see movement on this issue at all. It's never going uh, it's, it's never going to the state schedule at this point. Let's just be honest. But I think that you're going to have you're going to see some more meetings on this between both sides because people are going to try to make peace on it. I think you're probably right. And yeah. right now, yeah, we're far from that. You know who no one talked about in all of this? And um, and and because I know a lot of people in that sector is the nonprofit sector. Yeah. This is going to Again. hit the nonprofit sector Again. very hard. Uh, because they have to really up their fundraising. They've got to do, uh, you know, it, it's it's very very tough. Right. Um, and so I think I, I, I don't know what the answer to that is because on the other side of it, you can't say if you choose to work for a nonprofit, right. make less money. Right. Right. Just like you can't tell the restaurant owners figure it out. Right. You know, that's not helping. But it's definitely going to hurt the nonprofits and and uh, especially those with a fairly large employee base. And now, I mean, so, and, and we saw this Gordo recall. We just saw it on the brief. Well, I was going to ask you about that. So, uh, really, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I saw it now, now un unless the, the brief isn't saying everything. It is. I mean, really, the basis is he didn't answer a phone call, so I want to recall He's non-responsive to his constituents. So pretty much Victor Gordo didn't answer a couple of emails or something, or maybe didn't say hi to somebody in the street. And he's talking about recalling. That's not what this is about. What this comes down to is the council uh, or the city had its policy that if you were running an illegal pot shop yeah. before they did their pot ordinance, they would not give you a permit or an operating license once they came up with the ordinance to sell pot shop, to, to start to go into the pot business, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. Sean Sizemite didn't shut down when he was told to shut down. But he claims it's not about pot at all. Well, it's not about the pot shop at all. He it's does. It's about unresponsiveness. He, does. he says it's about unresponsiveness. Yeah. Well, they didn't respond when he asked for a permit. Yeah. <laughs> so they were unresponsive. Mm -hmm. Now, I take him at his word if he says that's what it's about. But my opinion, no, I think it's because he did not get his permit. And he's been put out of business. And they raided his place. Is there any reality to this at all? No, not at all. Not at all. He has a lot of money. But it doesn't come down to how much money you have. It comes down to how much money are you willing to spend on this issue. And you get nothing and out of it. And it comes down to the voters in his district. And, and, and you got to get a whole... Do you see any no. willingness to, look, to throw over Gordo look, this way? Look, when, when Chris Holden backed the NFL in the Rose Bowl mm -hmm. so the city could make more money off the Rose Bowl, even right. though he said he didn't want the NFL in town, he said it was a good use of the Rose Bowl. Right. And he collected signatures enough to get it to the ballot. And by the way, I supported that. You did? I did. Okay. There was a threat to recall Chris Holden, as you well know. I was almost lynched in West Pasadena, <laughs> but I supported it. You were almost lynched. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I chose that word uh, yeah. very deliberately. Yeah. Um, deliberately. Okay. You, back to what I was saying. I was viewed as the other in that. Uh, in that, in West Pasadena, you could not support. So what were they having? Drive by you name could, calling up there? Yeah, so, okay. You could not support the Rose Bowl <laughs> yeah, without, without so, being ostracized. So, there was a there was talk of a recall against Chris Holden in that group. Yeah, never developed. There was an attempt. There was an attempt a couple of years ago, a legitimate attempt to recall Steve Madison, which failed. Okay, somebody's got to go collect a whole bunch of signatures, and then Mark Jomsky is going to validate each and every one of those citizen signatures and make sure that those people live in District Five, mm -hmm. Victor Gordo's district. If he's successful there, and they remove Gordo's name, let's, let's say that he's successful. And then a whole bunch of people say, I want to run, and they toss their name in. People could just put Victor Gordo right back in there. Sure. He's not barred, but they will never get the signatures they need to do it. No, I don't think They so. will not. They will not. This is fool's gold. It's a waste of time. What do you think happens to Hampton now? Uh, you know what, Hampton, Hampton said that he did not support it. One of the things he said, he thought it would hurt youth mm -hmm. employment. And it has hurt youth employment, according to a chamber uh, poll. Tyrone has a lot of support in his district. Mm -hmm. 
Tyrone may be the most active council person in his district. I don't think this gets Tyrone removed from, from office. You don't? No. Now, if he were in District 2 or maybe District 4, I think it would. Mm -hmm. But not in District 1. Not in one of the minority districts. It will not. I think he won't have any problem getting, getting reelected. I don't think this will stop him. You don't think a progressive person can knock him off? I don't think anybody in town can beat an incumbent, period, right now. Uh. So do I think an incumbent person may rise up to challenge and make an issue out of this? Maybe. But you still have to go, go to the people in that district. Tyrone's had more than enough pancake bre breakfasts. <laughs> Tyrone has had more than enough meetings at the Rose Bowl, which is in his district, about employment. Tyrone's done a lot, pushed youth employment. So where do you now go to say, okay, this one mistake should cost him the job? And he's, he's a passing a native, too, and that's worth that's its true, weight yeah. in gold in this town. So, yeah. no, I, I don't think it will. I, I, I don't think it will. As a matter of fact, I think the next election is right around the time of the next presidential election. Uh, quite honestly, issue may be completely forgotten by then. So, now, if this did not pass, I think it would have impacted everybody who voted against it. Then I think they would have had something to worry about. Because then I think the progressive would have progressive would have really pushed the money to bring in people to try to bring it back up and get rid of it. But this way, I, I don't see it, to be quite honestly with you. So. so do the restaurants survive? I mean, is, is Green Street in trouble? You know, one of the things that when we had Robin on and when we had these other people on that we really didn't engage them on is, what are we calling loss? Are, are we talking about people who made $200,000 before the minimum wage and making $150,000 now? Yeah. Um, if, if we're talking about it that way, then they're still making good money. I mean, what is loss? So do I think, I think most of the restaurants survive. I think some of them, yeah, they're going to struggle. But you know what? I don't want to say you just got to fight it, but we'll come back to this All in right. a second. Should we stay on uh, for a few minutes? Yeah, let's do about We're going to go to Facebook. I also want to talk about Elon Omar. Okay. And we're going to do that on Facebook. That's it for us on the live stream. So I'm Barry Gordon. I'm Andre Coleman. And this is News Wrap live at 5. Come right back.